Artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Wow, I am excited because this is the very first episode of AI and You. We have some incredible guests coming up on future shows, and I will get to them in a minute. But first, what is this show all about? It's about artificial intelligence and you, and you, and you, and I start to sound like Oprah. There are a lot of yous out there. This might end up being a long series. The point here is that there are as many ways that AI can affect our lives as there are of us. So that's our purpose in a nutshell. What is artificial intelligence? What is it going to mean in your life, to your work, to your world? Because in one way or another, AI is going to touch all of us, and in many ways already has. We're going to be going broad on this series. We're not going to get into something so narrowly that we would lose a large fraction of the audience. Part of the reason for that is the human brain can only hold so much. We organize our knowledge and experience and expertise into silos, vertical stacks of ability. You can see that if you go onto a university campus and look at their directory, for example. Everywhere you'll see the same names, School of Business, School of Law, School of Engineering, etc., each organized into the same departments. If you're in higher education and I say the phrase transdisciplinary studies, what sort of reaction do you have? Maybe you have a positive reaction. In that case, I'd like to hear from you. I honestly would, because knowing how to do that is useful to us and to me. But I know that many of you probably had a reaction like, oh, don't go there. Don't want to think about that again. Still got the scars from the last time. Still trying to stop the different factions within the Department of Environmental Science from fighting. So we organize ourselves into these silos. Another example is to look at standard industry classifications. If you run a business, then you know when you had to make your filings. You had to look through this list of somewhere under 10,000 numbers that describe what businesses do and pick one or two or three or four of those to describe what you do and that those numbers had to go down on certain government forms. You were pigeonholed before you even started. And we have to organize our knowledge that way. We have no choice because the human brain can only hold so much and we can only cram things in at a certain rate. If you want to be an astronaut, a neurosurgeon, a Supreme Court judge, a concert pianist, you might have the ability to do any one of those things, but not all of them. We just don't have the time to fit them all in. If you want to make a contribution in the field of medicine, for instance, you're looking at what? 10 years of post-secondary education? Bachelor's, master's, PhD, postdoctoral work, med school, internship, and then you can start to advance the field. All the time you've been getting into narrower and narrower specializations. So what, you say? This is the way it has to be. What's wrong with that? The problem comes when we face disruption. And we sure are learning about disruption right now. Artificial intelligence has been described as the new electricity. Think of all the ways in which electricity changed the lives of humans. When that started, could anyone see the iPhone? As the outcome of that, could you have built an iPhone powered by steam? Actually, come to think of it, send those designs in. Steampunk enthusiasts, here's your chance. Send in those designs for steam-powered iPhones. But there was no segment of our life that was untouched by electricity. And that is how people are describing artificial intelligence. When something can affect that much of human life, What if the disruption happens in the gaps between those silos? What if it's a consequence of our not understanding the ways in which some of those well-explored silos interact with each other? To take a trite example, when the fields of machine vision, global positioning systems, artificial intelligence, and edge computing became big enough to intersect, 
What showed up at the intersection? Autonomous vehicles. That was an emergent consequence of those fields intersecting. It's at the interfaces between systems that problems occur. Take, for example, the Mars Climate Orbiter, one of the space missions that we lost because of a conversion failure. One subsystem was expecting units to be in pounds. Another was expecting it to be in kilograms. They exchanged numbers, didn't understand what the numbers meant. The mission was lost. So the goal of this podcast is to explore so many of the implications and impacts of artificial intelligence that it catalyzes new thinking in your mind. Like, that makes me think of something new, or I see how that could apply to my situation. Let's look at some of the guests we have coming up, and you'll get the idea of just what I mean by going broad. We will start with Audrey Tang, the Digital Information Minister for Taiwan. She's in charge of helping government agencies communicate policy goals and managing information published by the government, both via digital means. Talk about front and center of the world stage. Right now, Taiwan's response to the coronavirus pandemic is amazing, almost unparalleled throughout the world. And what's even more amazing is that it was achieved without resorting to the kind of police state tactics that many expected would be necessary, especially from a nation that close to mainland China. And what's even more amazing is that it was done without much special effort, and the response emerged as a natural consequence of the so-called digital democracy that Audrey has implemented throughout the country, a kind of participatory democracy that empowers the people to make decisions that affect them. Now, this has huge ramifications for the deployment of artificial intelligence by governments, especially with what it could be used for in surveillance. We will get to hear from Audrey how governments can use AI to empower the people instead of oppressing them. Then we will have Judith and Garfield Reeves Stevens, science fiction authors with numerous credits, especially within Star Trek, for screenwriting and novel writing. You may ask, what does science fiction have to do with artificial intelligence? Well, the watchword for this podcast series is disruption. Disruption happens when the future arrives faster than we were expecting. And the exponential growth of artificial intelligence guarantees that we can expect more disruption as a result of it. We are doubling the size of our machine learning models every three months at the moment. So to get an idea about how to think productively about where we might be going in the future, who better to talk to than science fiction authors? People who spend the whole day thinking about what might be coming in the future. Then we will have Ryan Darcy. He has seen naked brains, up close and personal, while they were still in use. He is a neuroscientist, working on the cutting edge of understanding and fixing broken brains. We met when he was a fellow speaker at my last TEDx event, and his story was about Trevor Green, a soldier in Afghanistan who had an axe sunk into his head. You've heard the saying, I need that like, I need a hole in the head. That's what Trevor had. Now, everyone else had given up on him, told his wife he'd be a vegetable. Why is it that no one ever says what kind of vegetable? It seems like it should make a difference, whether it's cabbage or sprouts or cauliflower. Anyway, I digress. Ryan called his wife and said, I think I can help. And if you want to see the result, you can judge for yourself by watching his TEDx talk, because Trevor was on the stage with him as his co-speaker. Those guests and many other fascinating ones coming up on future shows. A quick interlude, which we will do in these shows from time to time, an item ripped from today's headlines about artificial intelligence. Teen programmer Leon Hillman took the open source self-driving software from comma.ai and connected it so it could play the game Grand Theft Auto V. Why is this such a big deal? Because only a few years ago that would have required a team of PhDs. And now... It's commoditized and monetized and open source to the extent that a teenager can do it in what we presume is a short amount of time. After all, he's still a teenager. The idea that 
self-driving software is also open source is amazing in and of itself. More news items later. So why all the fuss about AI? Because its issues, its challenges, its benefits run all the way from serious, worthy of consideration right now, to world-shattering in the future. Right now, for instance, if you fed AI all the information that was known about everyone on the planet, it would be capable of putting it together in ways that extracted radical new information from it. This is the goal of a large number of highly positioned companies and government agencies. When you can do that, what are the issues and solutions around privacy, bias, transparency, accountability, and explainability? Looking a little further into the future, we have the issue of automation and its effect on employment. What new jobs will be created and what existing jobs will be lost? How will the revenue from the AI dividend be transferred and will people be left out? And beyond that, further into the future, there is the question of what happens when AI becomes generally intelligent, matching human capabilities. What are the implications of AI becoming super intelligent, far beyond human capabilities? How would we communicate with them? How would we coexist with them? That might be a long way in the future, but on the other hand, it might take us a very long time to prepare ourselves. So AI is very rich with lots of things that we need to think about, and let's try to make them interesting to learn about at the same time. A little bit about me. My name is Peter Scott. I have a book on this stuff. It's called Crisis of Control, How Artificial Superintelligence May Destroy or Save the Human Race. I will mention it frequently. It's the product of a lot of concentrated thinking about the issues surrounding how artificial intelligence might evolve and affect us. It's a great way of assimilating the ideas in this podcast at a speed that's dictated by you. On February 29th, I was at TEDx Bear Creek Park talking about what to do to save us from being left behind by AI. That talks video and links to buying my book are found in the show notes, and you can also go to humancusp.com. That's H-U-M-A-N-C-U-S-P dot com. I've started a group called the Next Wave Institute that has members from several countries. We are working on partnering with educational institutions to train this generation and the next in how to deal with the disruption from artificial intelligence. It's one of those cross-cutting issues, like when I was talking about interdisciplinary studies. It's a way of putting a context around everything that people at, say, the undergraduate level are learning, and that gives some new meaning and purpose to their curriculum. We're going to have a lot more questions than answers on this show, although we will have answers, partly. That's because a lot of the things we would like to have an answer to, no one has an answer to. Like, when are we going to get artificial general intelligence? But this is a good thing, because questions are one of the things that make us uniquely human. And that's something that we need to explore in a lot greater depth. Computer memory banks are full of answers. There's not a single question among them, at least not yet anyway. So if you want to avoid your job being taken by a machine, be the one who asks the questions, not just one who gives the answers. Obviously there are limits to this. Like, the boss says, when can you have that program written by? Well, what do you mean by program? What do you mean by write? What exactly is time? All great questions, by the way. Wrong time to ask them. But if the kind of answers you deliver are the kinds they could get from Google, then how long before the people you deliver them to discover that they could ask the questions of Google and read the answers before you finished speaking? Incidentally, when Google first came out, I was an early user of it because I was writing search engines at the time, and when I saw Google, I was like, okay, game over. I was able to be quite successful in teleconference meetings because I would research without people being able to see what I was doing. Someone would wonder, say, what are the top vendors in XYZ space? And I would go on mute, type, 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 off mute. Well, there are three main players, but the one with the greatest market share is... And people would go, ooh. So look at the power of questions. As a certified coach, I'm trained to ask questions and especially not to give answers. 
And that's because of the power of asking them. Look at the power of the question that America asked in 1961. Can we get to the moon? That took us all the way to Apollo 11. The moment we answered that question, stepped out onto the moon, things changed. Can you name the first man on the moon? Sure. Can you name the second man on the moon? I'm betting you can. Can you name the crew of Apollo 12? Fine men, just as heroic. But we'd already answered the question that Kennedy asked. Things changed after that. So always be looking for the next question. Another news item ripped from the headlines. David Ferrucci, the man who built IBM's Jeopardy playing machine, Watson, wants to give AI common sense. Of course, we like to say that common sense is anything but common. But what's this? Referring to the holy grail of AI as artificial general intelligence, AGI, something we will discuss on the show. It's the ability of AI to perform general tasks, to have the intelligence even of a human toddler in being able to do a seemingly infinite variety of things within the world. Common sense would have a lot to do with artificial general intelligence because the presupposition of AGI is that the intelligence exhibiting it has experience within the physical world. It knows about physical things within the world. Whereas intelligence that knows only about abstractions that have no material component isn't going to be very useful beyond, say, proving mathematical theorems. It isn't going to have much general level of intelligence, no matter how powerful it might be, because we're not going to have interesting conversations with it. Will David Ferrucci be successful? This is one of the most important questions of our time. Decades ago, Doug Lanat tried to create artificial general intelligence with a system called Psych by feeding it many, many, many truths about our world. Facts, assertions like birds can fly, ostriches, though, are birds that cannot fly. Penguins are also birds that cannot fly, and over and over putting these assertions into psych in the hope that if enough were input, it would be able to connect them together to exhibit artificial general intelligence. That didn't happen. If we were able to create artificial general intelligence by connecting enough assertions like that together, it would probably take billions of them, and we don't have that yet. It's important to put some context on this podcast by mentioning the date. If you're listening to this from the far future, if you're a historian in the future who is looking at some content from years gone by, then you need to know that this was recorded in June of 2020. And if you want to know the significance of that, go look up through your brain connection to Wikipedia, the great coronavirus pandemic. Hopefully there was only one. Now look at the timeline and get an idea of the state of things in early June. We are going to be dividing our lives in the future into the years BC and AD, before coronavirus and after deliverance. But right now, we're in the gap between them. And that hurts. So you people in the future with your flying cars and your pet robots, have some sympathy for us, because we're not only dealing with a virus, but... Of late now, we have been going through some tremendous upheavals as some old wounds that were never healed to do with race are getting exposed again. All that while we're still doing the social distancing and quarantining and other rules for handling a pandemic. One of the reasons I'm doing this as a podcast and not a video is that I haven't had a haircut in three months. One of the things that I've observed as a result of this pandemic is that a large number of people are not able to take drastic action without also panicking. They are not able to do one without the other. Can't separate them. So some of the conversation that I've had around the beginning of the pandemic went like, I think you should be taking this and this kind of action. Oh no, I don't want to live in fear. Well, I wasn't talking about fear. I was saying that this and this and this should be prudent courses of action. Yes, but oh, I'm I'm not going to freak out about this. Uh, no one said anything about freaking out, but these important actions might be very necessary at this time. Well, I'm going to ignore this. I'm sure it's nothing, really. Now, I was familiar with this kind of behavior because I'd encountered it already in the talks that I give about artificial intelligence. As you might imagine from the title of my book, there are positive and negative effects that are possible with AI. 
But when I was talking about the negative effects, I found that most people would want to either freak out about those or ignore them, pretend they weren't going to happen. Neither of those reactions is something I thought was useful. And I think it's also why a lot of people wanted to ask me if I was an optimist or pessimist about the future with AI. And in general, I've stopped answering that question because there is no direct response to that that produces a useful answer. If I say I'm optimistic, then people will go, OK, then I guess I don't have to worry or do anything about this. If I say I'm pessimistic, they go, oh my god, the sky is falling. But what we really need to do is look at AI not as a good thing, not as a bad thing, but as a big thing that is going to happen, and what are we going to do about it? Now, I actually had training in dealing with things that require drastic action. I've been certified in scuba diving and skydiving. Those are two sports where you face a significant chance of suddenly encountering the possibility of imminent death. Not to put you off. But this is why you go through training, because you can be trained to deal with those possibilities and come out safely. But if you panic in those situations, you will shred your chances of survival. So I learned how to face even the prospect of sudden death without panicking. And that's what we need to do. Not just about AI, but pandemics as well. Now, when I talk about AI having these positive and negative outcomes, people say, well, yes. AI is a dual-use technology, like so many other things. The problem is that is minimizing the issue too much, because when we hear dual-use technology, we have a standard response to that. We know what that means. A hammer is dual-use technology. You can use it to build a house, or you can hit someone over the head with it. So don't hit people over the head with it. Problem solved. But the risk factors of AI are much more complicated than the scenario of deliberately using it for malicious outcomes. We will get into that more and more in future shows. So this is why I talk about the effects of artificial intelligence as being disruptive, because that is both positive and negative. And we are getting a masterclass in disruption right now, as I said earlier, courtesy of COVID-19, among other things. We'll come out of this better experienced at dealing with disruption. And then we'll look at other crises that have been brewing for a while and we'll charge into solving them. Climate change. Let's do it. Bring it on. But it won't be like before, like, let's build a sort of maybe consensus for some sort of maybe goals that sort of maybe will address the problem. It will be get on board or get out of the way. Or maybe it won't be climate change that's the next big thing. Certainly there's an economic day of reckoning in our future as a result of everything we've done to address coronavirus. But expect us to solve that the way that coronavirus is teaching us. Immediate and drastic action. And running across all of this will be AI. It will be a crisis of its own, and it will solve crises. It will be a new actor. To try and get at how AI could be a crisis, I was talking about silos earlier. Complexity itself can pose an existential risk. And AI is incredibly complex. We deal with complexity by wrapping things up in increasing levels of hierarchy. We're not greatly more intelligent than people were in the days of Einstein, Newton, and Aristotle, but we can do more than they could in those days by virtue of standing on their shoulders to use Newton's words. So we have to spend our time on concepts that encapsulate more complexity. If you're a computer programmer, you know what I'm talking about. This is like using a code library where other people have done the work and you just make a simple call that behind the scenes does a whole lot of things that would have been far too much work for you to do by yourself. So nowhere do you see this idea of wrapping up complexity in layers that have been previously handled more than in computer science. When I was in high school, I learned to edit a paper tape by hand. Go look it up. That is a waste of neurons today. Today, we assume that not just ASCII, but Unicode is at the foundation of our information storage. I don't need to go punch holes in a piece of adhesive webbing to edit a program any longer. But the very complexity of artificial intelligence can pose a risk by being something that we just don't want to try and understand. And by the time it hits us, it's too late. 
more about that again in future shows. Another item from today's headlines about AI. A team of researchers from the Higher School of Economics University and Open University in Moscow, Russia, claim that they have demonstrated that an AI can make accurate personality judgments based on selfies alone, more accurately than some humans. Their AI, quote, can make a correct guess about the relative standing of two randomly chosen individuals on a personality dimension in 58% of cases, unquote. If 58% doesn't sound impressive, it is better than chance by a considerable way. Of course, our minds rapidly go to the dystopian possibilities of this. Hollywood has raised us well. But we also want our machines to understand our moods. I would like it if Alexa didn't interrupt me at times when I'm having an intense discussion with my children, for instance. So getting AIs to get better at reading emotional context and personality is an important thing. I know, with all this talk about risks of AI, it might sound like this is going to be a show focused on what's wrong with it and what could it do to us that would be negative. But we're really going to be looking at least as much at the positive effects. It's just that we're biologically conditioned to focus on the negative. The consequences for missing a fruit-laden tree when you're not starving were minimal. You could afford to ignore it, but you could not afford to ignore a leopard hidden in the grass. So we pay a lot more attention to negative possibilities. So even though it might sound as though we're out to get AI by any way possible, like a lawyer arguing in court that the defendant is guilty of this, and if he's not guilty of that, then he's guilty of this, and if he was not guilty of that, then he's definitely guilty of this other thing. But that's not what we're doing we're going to be exploring the space of the effects of AI. For instance, jobs. We all spend a lot of time talking about the possible effects on jobs because to say there is no agreement on that would be an understatement. There are diametrically opposed opinions as to what AI will do to jobs. The fact is, we don't know. On the one hand, you have people saying that no technological advance in history has ever resulted in a net decrease in jobs, On the other hand, you have people saying we've never had machines that can think before. But even with jobs, the effects of large numbers of them being automated is that many menial, rote, demeaning, repetitive, unhealthy jobs will be eliminated. And isn't that a good thing? We no longer need to use children to sweep chimneys. We should be glad of that. The counterpoint to the possibility of automated trucks putting millions of truck drivers out of work is that sitting in a truck cab for 14 hours a day should not be the best choice anyone has. Even if they really like it, there ought to be better options available to them. And in a market where we have to have truck drivers that are human, there may not be that better option for some people. But what new jobs might be created by AI? That's really hard to say. If AI is like electricity, then, well, look how many jobs were created as a result of that. Before electricity came along, 90% of the jobs were in agriculture. We can start getting at this by looking at intersections of fields, those silos of knowledge that I was talking about earlier, and look at some of the ones that we don't normally associate with each other. For instance, one day in the future, the fields of artificial intelligence and psychiatry will intersect there will be a position of AI psychiatrist. Doesn't exist now, can't tell you how long it will be before it does, but one day that will be a thing. Why do I pick that as an example? Because the more sophisticated our AI gets, the more it tries to interpret and mimic human personality, the more we're going to program it by arguing with it in some way. And now we're getting into psychiatrist territory, except that the psychology of an AI is going to be radically different from that of a human. Now, I have to say something about fake news. Fake news and conspiracy theories are a huge problem right now. Some of it is being assisted by AI. We'll talk about that in a future show, and what AI could do to improve the situation. But on this show, we are not going to make it worse. AI has come in for its share of conspiracy theories, of course. This show isn't going to promote them. There are more than enough places you can go to find that if that's what you're looking for. Now, we do, nevertheless, have to do some speculation. We're not going to be just reporting on what's already happened. Our job is to think about where we're going. And there's no law that says that some threat will always become obvious in enough time for us to mitigate it. Climate change is an obvious example. 
it's still not clear to a large enough fraction of the population for the US government to be on board with mitigation protocols, and yet we may have already passed the point of no return. So part of our job is going to be coming up with useful speculation about where we're going with AI. The further out we look, the more fantastic it will be. But despite the fact that that will involve speculating about what governments and, yes, large corporations might be doing without being completely transparent about it, we are not going to promote the conspiracies. So have I rambled? Yes, but I'm doing this job because it needs to be done. If you're thinking, this guy doesn't sound like a professional talk show host, well, you're right. I was and am a computer nerd. But I decided that this job had to be done, and so I needed to become a better speaker. So I took Toastmasters, because I saw people there who were fantastic speakers. And after I went through a lot of training, they still are fantastic. And as for me... I feel the comparison to be drawn is with the little scene Monty Python skit where Graham Chapman is dressed as a scientist. He's pointing at a poster of a penguin and a man saying, here is the brain of the penguin. And it's outlined on the silhouette of the penguin. And it's smaller than that of the man. But if we scale up the penguin until the penguin is the same height as the man, its brain is still not as big as the man's. But... And here is the key point. It is bigger than it used to be. And that's the key point for me, which is all that matters is that my speaking brain is bigger than it used to be. So tell me what you want to hear, what you want asked, what you want answered on this show. Maybe that speaking brain will get a little bit bigger. Another item from recent headlines, very topical for today. Blue Dot, a Canadian startup was one of the first companies to realize what was happening with COVID-19 because they applied machine learning to news reports and that told them what wasn't explicit in those reports, that there was something important happening virally in China. So that's it for now. In future shows, we'll also have audio that was recorded in our archives of talks with members of the Canadian Artificial Intelligence Association. Some interviews I did there with Chris Drummond of the National Research Council of Canada, Adifa Farzinda, the founder of NLP Technologies, and Michael Bowling, professor of computer science at the University of Alberta. Those will be some lengthy interviews that we'll parcel up and put out here for you. Until next time, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Crisis of Control and see more videos and articles at AIandYou.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U dot net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.